According to Forbes in 2021, Americans wagered $57 billion on sports, a number that was up 165% from the year previous. As a result, MMA broadcasts are leaning into betting more than ever, bringing on experts to give advice and showing line movement and prop odds throughout the event. Cards are regularly sponsored by sportsbooks. I just saw a commercial with UFC commentator John Anik for DraftKings as I was writing this. But with this surge in popularity has come some concern. In October, the UFC changed their fighter code of conduct to prohibit betting on on fights. And just a few weeks later, a bout on a fight night card launched an investigation after a suspicious amount of action just hours before the event, leading to the suspension of a well-known head coach pending the results. As sports betting becomes a more and more prominent aspect of the product in mixed martial arts for the promoters, the fighters, and the fans, should we be worried about the implications? Are we headed down a path that could potentially damage the sport we love so much? Well, as noted MMA fanatic Carl Sagan once said, you have to know the past to understand the present. So with that in mind, in today's video, let's take a look at the long sordid relationship between gambling and combat sports to see what might lie ahead for mixed martial arts. I'm Tommy from MMA on Point, and I'm wondering, does MMA have a gambling problem? We often say that MMA is young, and it's true. If you're talking about the sport in the US, you can only go as far back as 1993. My youngest brother is older than that, and it only really starts looking like the sport we understand MMA to be today in the late 90s when things like the 10 point must system began implementation, along with the unified rules. So, we don't even have 30 years of history. Not to mention the sport was very much niche here in the United States until the tough boom, and even then it really wouldn't start reaching its heights for some time thereafter. So when we look at MMA through the lens of sports betting, it really only becomes a more prominent aspect of it for a much larger general audience in very recent history. But that is not the case for our combat sports cousin, boxing, which has been massively popular since the mid-1800s. That statement isn't entirely accurate though. See, they had their own period of outlaw status. And this is even after the Marcus of Queensbury rules began implementation in 1867. Prize fighting was underground, banned in most places, and seen as criminal. It's only in the early 1900s that we start seeing the popularization of pro boxing on a large scale in both Britain and the US. So to really give you perspective on the age of MMA, boxing had a longer history over 100 years ago than we have right now altogether. And the heights of boxing's popularity dwarves mixed martial arts even today. Late career Ali drew 90 million viewers on ABC for his rematch with Leon Spinks. If you put Conor McGregor versus Brock Brock Lesnar on ABC Today, it's not getting anywhere even close to that. And that's just that one fight. There are insane estimations about the heights of Ali's career, and claims I can't possibly back up with evidence that like a billion people worldwide watched the Rumble in the Jungle. I have no idea how that number could be true, but let's say it's 50% true. 500 million people is enough to get the point across that these numbers are not realistic to MMA. So if you want to look at what might be in store for mixed martial arts as it relates to gambling, boxing is a good place to start given that it's a fellow combat sport, has a much longer history, and has seen heights that had the sport firmly in the eyes of betters on a large scale. So let's talk about the Mafia. Now, fight fixes aren't exclusive to organized crime. As early as 1890, there were scandals, and over the years, many boxers, promoters, and officials from all around the world have come forward to reveal that they were involved in shady business for one reason or another. Why I want to focus on the mob, however, is because one of their favorite money-making ventures was illegal betting, and while they had their hand in other sports, they essentially owned boxing in the 40s and 50s. The sport's governing body at the time was mob-run. Frankie Carbo, they called him the czar of boxing, the guy was the most powerful figure in the sport during that era. The IBC, the International Boxing Club, was called the Octopus because it controlled everything. You couldn't fight. Coupled with their hold on all the major arenas, their TV contracts, and Frank Carbo threatening to break anybody's legs, that was it. They controlled everything. If you wanted to fight at MSG, if you wanted to be a champion, if you wanted to be anybody in boxing, Carbo was the guy who decided if it happened. There was one venue, and it was called Madison Square Garden, and Carbo did business there. He was a mobster, a killer in his early days. The reason he finally went to jail long term in 1961 was because of a conviction for conspiracy and extortion related to his running of the boxing world. He was subpoenaed by the U.S. Senate for the famous Kafafa hearings on organized crime that led to the RICO Act. A major component of that committee's work focused on boxing's corruption. Jake LaMotta testified for them under oath that he threw his fight with Billy Fox for the mob. Sonny Liston, the heavyweight champion of the world and another Carbo fighter. The reason his two losses to Ali were so controversial is because of his ties to the Mafia. The fact that the fights were a bit weird had many assuming they were fixed. I personally don't think either of them were, but you still have people to this day who swear it up and down. At the bout, you were directly situated to see Clay throw the punch. Was there a punch? 
Yes, there was a punch, Howard, but I didn't think it was hard enough to crush a grape. Following all that heat, however, and a loss of power, the mob gave up on total control of the sport but didn't leave boxing. They simply changed their approach. As the sport's popularity ballooned as well as the fight purses, organized crime began focusing on getting a percentage of the take on the night and owning fighters' contracts over fixing fights since large bets would raise suspicions. Infamous mobster-turned-government witness Sammy the Bull Gravano was asked by a Senate subcommittee in 1993 if it would be possible to get organized crime out of boxing, and he told them only if they make the purses smaller. In response to the findings of that hearing, the Boxing Safety Act of 1996 would be passed into law, which required every state putting on an event to have a government-run commission to oversee everything, as well as a host of other provisions to protect fighters and the integrity of the sport. And that bill, in turn, would lead to the Ali Act in 2000. Both of these federal laws were in response to the long-term corruption the sport had seen as a result of organized crime. And while boxing isn't perfect today and still absolutely has some shady figures heavily involved in it, it is certainly a far cry from when the mob was literally in charge of it. MMA, at least in the US, was born into this period of reform and would largely benefit as a result. That is, once they stopped trying to ban it everywhere and decided to consider it an actual sport. What is drawing millions of modern Americans to the bloody games? The many missteps boxing took and had tried to rectify, like state commission regulation, would ensure that MMA May had systems in place almost immediately to counteract the potential for corruption on a scale that was seen during the mob era of boxing. The same can't be said for Japan, where the Yakuza literally owned Pride FC and did participate in many of the same crimes as the mob during the 50s. The company fixed them. See, they wanted it was something new in Japan, and they needed to get people on their side. Luckily, though, depending on how you look at it, by 2007, Pride was dead and the UFC remained the sole superpower, thus eliminating the criminal element from the highest level of the sport. Which isn't to say that MMA hasn't had its fair share of controversies. But the most well-known examples largely seem detached from the idea of rigging a fight for sports betting purposes. There was, of course, the Anthony Macias Oleg Taktarov fight at UFC 6, a bout that Macias has claimed their mutual manager forced him to take a dive in, losing to Oleg in just 9 seconds. But the explanation didn't mention anything about sports betting. It was a manager wanting to protect one of his clients he felt had a better chance of winning the tournament prize money. In our Unsolved series, we took a deep dive into fixed fights in Japan, which which largely focused on the same idea, wanting to prop up certain fighters' reputations or make for a more exciting product. Even in Pride, where the Yakuza were making money in illicit ways, Mark Coleman's thrown fight with Takata was to bolster the Japanese pro wrestling star's reputation. The Seth Petrozelli Kimbo Slice situation, where afterwards Seth claimed he was told not to take Kimbo down and then later retracted that statement. The promoters kind of hinted to me and they gave me the money to stand and trade with him. They didn't want me to take him down, let's just put it that way. It was worth my while to try and stand and punch with him. Same thing, Slice was a money-making fighter, and so if that fight had truly been fixed, it would have made the most sense that it would have been for that reason in order to protect his drawing power. So I'm gonna bet, take a chance that Seth's gonna get him down and, and submit him. But you don't know the scumbag promoters behind the scenes went in and paid him to not go to the ground. That's fucking illegal. It's a point that Sammy the Bull brought up in that Senate hearing, that the mob after the 60s didn't focus on sports betting as much because it was too risky. Huge suspicious bets raise alarms, and the fight purses owning the fighters, that was the racket because to the outside world, it's all legit. Your fighter is winning and you're skimming off the top, which could absolutely lead to fixed fights, but without a sports betting focus. All that said, there has been suspicious gambling related issues issues in mixed martial arts in recent history. In 2017, Taehyun Bang was given 92 grand to throw his fight with Leo Kuntz by an organized crime element in South Korea. He himself took half that bribe and betted on Kuntz. But a historically large shift in the odds for the fight as a result of major money being put on Leo right before the event tipped off UFC officials, who actually approached both fighters before they walked out to let them know of the situation and that if they had a suspicious performance, they would be investigated. So Joe and Sean called them. And uh, he said, no, no, it's not, uh, I would never, blah, blah, blah. And he didn't do it, but he got, he still went to jail. Bang would go full Mickey O'Neill and win the fight despite the fix, even returning the money after the fact. Too little too late though, the mob allegedly lost 1.7 million on the deal and were looking to off the fighter, and for his role in the situation he was sentenced to 10 months in prison. Earlier this year, a PFL event that was pre-taped was accidentally promoted as live, and sportsbooks were taking action on them until they were informed the bouts had already taken place after the fact, which led to them freezing the accounts of those that did place wagers pending further review to make sure no funny business 
process was taking place, with all winnings being voided out. And as a result of the fiasco, the Arizona Department of Gaming removed the PFL from their wagering catalog. Then there was of course the recent story that was the catalyst for this entire video, the bout between Derek Minner and Shaila Nordic Becca at UFC Vegas 64. Hours before the bout would take place, there was a huge shift in the betting line in favor of Nordic Becca to win by first round TKO. Sounds like a familiar situation to something else we just talked about. Sports books were worried and stopped allowing wagers over concerns of foul play, and then Minner, who would injure his knee very early on, lost via TKO in the first round, and later revealed that he had come into the bout injured. Now, please note, I am not accusing anybody of anything at all. This is an ongoing investigation, and so any speculation about any kind of wrongdoing would be inappropriate. I'm simply bringing up the fact that this is a notable occurrence, the first since the bang incident. And at current, Menner's head coach James Krause has been suspended by the New Jersey Division of Gambling Enforcement from appearing cage side during bouts for his team pending the results of the investigation. I make more money gambling on MMA than I do anything else. Come on, more than even coaching? Oh God, that don't make shit on coaching. The thing is though, while these situations can happen, there should be very little concern on a large scale, even though we are seeing this massive boom in sports betting recently. And the reason I say that is for several reasons. The UFC has been the torchbearer for the sport for decades now, and their fight for legitimacy with state regulators and the general public has led to the promotion running a very clean product, at least as it relates to potential sports betting corruption. It has been in their best interest since the beginning to ensure the product is as legit as possible in that regard. Unlike boxing, the sport was born into an era that was a reaction to the decades of corruption in combat sports on a large scale. And as such, MMA has benefited greatly from the systems that have been put in place to prevent these types of scandals. State regulation, gaming boards, independent watchdog groups like US Integrity that are always tracking events for suspicious betting activity and are partners with promotions and sports books. The UFC code of conduct change that happened recently where fighters, their teams, and even their families are no longer allowed to bet on bouts. UFC UFC exec Hunter Campbell explained that was spurred on by government agencies. It wasn't something they took the initiative on, it was to ensure that they could continue to get licensed. So yet another example of systems being put in place to discourage illegal activity. And then there was the testimony at that Senate hearing that it's far more lucrative for organized crime to make money off money fighters these days than it would be to try to find a book they could work a scheme with that would somehow not tip off an investigation for large wagers by the federal government, the promotions themselves, or any of these watchdog groups. They're much easier and safer ways to make illicit cash. And look, the two instances we have seen in recent years that were suspicious. That's two fights. There's like a million a year for the last decade. And both situations were largely known by even the general fandom before the fights took place. This isn't something you can hide very well these days if you're trying to do something nefarious. Not to mention, the US is obsessed with sports being legit. Congress met to talk about cheating in baseball. The federal government spent taxpayer money to find out if Mark McGuire was on the sauce. I will use whatever influence and popularity that I have to discourage young athletes from taking any drug that is not recommended by a doctor. That is insane. There's nothing Americans hate more than finding out their sports aren't real, and that obsession bleeds into everything here. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> the biggest disaster your sport can have is losing its legitimacy. And given that the US houses three of the most major promotions in the sport, I think that point is relevant. All that said, given the history of corruption in combat sports that we journeyed through today, no wonder fans are suspicious of anything that seems in any way out of the ordinary to them. Not to mention this is one of the few sports that a single athlete can rig an event and guarantee an outcome. But I think those fears are generally unwarranted. There are too many systems in place now because of combat sports troubled past and too many eyes on the product for large scale corruption, at least as it relates to rigging fights so you can win big at the sports book. But what do you guys think? Could this end up being a widespread issue in the future or are the systems in place discouraging enough to halt most funny business? Let us know in the comments below, please. And if you're so inclined, liking and subscribing would be a big help for us. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you at the horse track.